the fancies of fussy agitators, establishing the Royal Naval College, Dartmouth. A 43-minute presentation held in the Collingwood Room at the Joint Services Command Staff College, Shrivenham, on the 5th of May 2008. The speaker is Dr Harry Dickinson from the Defence Studies Department, King's College, London. The datum point for modern officer training, that is training coincident with the onset of the machine age, lies with something called Admiralty Circular 288 of February 1857, which directed that all naval cadets should spend three months on board a harbour training ship before passing out into the fleet. These regulations first applied in August of that year when 23 cadets joined HMS Illustrious moored in Hasler Creek in Portsmouth. By the end of the year, more than 100 were under training, and this soon doubled, an increase prompting the introduction of a larger vessel. On the 1st of January 1859, HMS Britannia was commissioned, and the so-called Britannia system, which was to train virtually all the senior officers of both World War I and World War II, that system was established. And this is a picture, it's one of the very few photographs of this particular ship. Most of the images show her successor, the fifth of the name. This Britannia was a three-decker of 1820, and as you can see, unlike her successor, she was fully rigged. She served at Portsmouth, at Portland, and finally at Dartmouth, where she was on station from 1863 until 1869. Now, there was much praise for the early Britannia system, which improved retention and reduced misconduct rates considerably. An Admiralty return of 1863 noted, quote, that the Britannia does her work right well and infinitely better than the previous system. The training ship, it was also noted, had assumed a character of national importance. But it's clear from my research that despite much favourable comment, the Britannia was not universally admired. And she was also part of a broader debate about how young officers should be trained and educated. Now, this debate was conducted at several levels, principally within the service press, where legions of unemployed officers on half pay demonstrated that no matter was too trivial for consideration, with debate ranging from the smoking habits of trainees, the desirability of sending cadets to the Arctic, and the brand of soap most suitable for young officers. Yet in the midst of the ephemeral and the eccentric, the press also produced serious consideration of the training problem. The Army and Navy Gazette, for example, devoted four leading articles to the subject in 1862 alone, several of which explored the possibility of establishing a naval college ashore. In a leading article of November 1862, it condemned, quote, the suffocating sleeping spaces on board our model training ship which are sufficient to sow diseases and sap the lives of the unlucky boys who are unconsciously inhaling a poisonous atmosphere. In fact, as I hope this picture shows, sleeping arrangements on board the ship were a good deal better than a contemporary man of war of the period. And the records of the medical director general suggest that Britannia's public health probably differed little from that of a contemporary public school. Nevertheless, it was a constant source of irritation. The obvious remedy was for the ship to be replaced by a proper naval establishment. And the paper noted that the First Lord now had, quote, an excellent opportunity for pressing upon his colleagues the value of a naval college to be erected in a convenient locality. Now, some of this debate found its way into the findings of an 1863 select committee established to give some order to officers' career structures. The committee heard evidence from 20 senior officers responding to a series of propositions, including number eight, that a naval college be established and that no cadets be sent to sea under the age of 16. Almost all agreed that despite the valuable work being done in the Britannia, a naval college ashore was more desirable. The committee recommended that, quote, the expediency of establishing a naval college with training brigs and small steamers attached to it should be considered, and that the college should be made self-supporting. At the First Lord's instigation, a further 54 commanding officers were asked and found to be in favour of a shore establishment. A survey of 38 sites along the south coast was conducted and a plan of each site made. 
Now, why these proposals advance no further is unclear, but it's probably related to the prevailing financial climate, which saw the Navy as a prime target for economies in public expenditure. The 1861 naval estimates, for example, were not matched for a further 17 years. This slide gives an idea of the state of the estimates over the period, most of it coincidental with the seashore debate. £10 million a year, incidentally, supported an establishment of about 40,000 men. And this, I think, often comes as a surprise when you look at these expenditure levels to people who have visions of an all-powerful, almighty Victorian Navy. And given this sort of depressed financial climate, I don't think we should be too surprised that after a brief flurry, the issue of a new shoreside college returned to the shadows. But it re-emerged with the appointment of the Rice Committee to inquire into cadets' education in 1874. Now, Rice had its origins not in the education of cadets, but in the health and habitability of their surroundings. And in this regard, the committee swiftly awarded the Britannia a clean bill of health. Yet at the same time, they were concerned about youngsters spending extended periods in the ship and felt that training time if it was extended, it must be ashore rather than afloat. Nevertheless, Britannia's excellence as a place of residence was stressed, and the discipline on board, which produced, quote, force of character and enthusiasm for the service, was emphasized. Yet equally, there was much to recommend a naval college with a distinct atmosphere and a regime of its own, derived not from a warship, but from the best of the British public schools. By this time, of course, training was conducted in the 5th Britannia, formerly the Prince of Wales of 1848, seen here at Dartmouth with the frigate Hindustan attached at the mouth of Old Mill Creek. And for those of you who have been down to the West Country recently, it is quite remarkable just how little the field patterns and the general topography of the area have changed. Most of the Rice recommendations were accepted by the First Lord, George Ward Hunt, and appeared in subsequent regulations. The exception was the new college, which previous commentators have argued was ignored. In fact, my research suggests that the new Tory administration took it very seriously, and the 1876 estimates, for example, show a total of £65,000, quote, to be allocated towards the building of a new college. It was also clear that Ward Hunt wanted the college at Dartmouth, for in that year, he asked the medical director general to report on the suitability of a site above the town. As usual, the service press monitored the situation closely. The Broad Arrow, in contrast with its competitor, the Army and Navy Gazette, was a long-standing opponent of the college. It noted that if the building of a naval college was an example of Tory reform, then the government would do better, quote, to return to its proper policy and not compromise itself by adopting the fancies of fussy agitators. In fact, moves to scrap Britannia and replace her with a college were halted, ironically, not by the strength of the opposition, but by the strength of the support. Within weeks of the Rice Report, offers to sell land for a new college flooded in. The situation was complicated by land at Poole, offered as a gift, and political sensitivity sharpened as various MPs for seaside towns trumpeted the praises of their particular locality. As the clamour grew, the First Lord warned his staff that they should on no account enter into correspondence with vendors. This is George Ward Hunt, First Lord of the Admiralty, and thus political head of the Navy, a big man described by Disraeli as having the sagacity of an elephant and some of its form. <laughs> well, big and flabby he may have been, but his political antenna was exceptionally well-tuned. And sensing difficulty ahead, the First Lord abandoned plans to move directly ashore at Dartmouth and instead appointed a committee to consider the whole question. Now this was the Wellesley Committee of 1876. They were to report on the general nature of the surroundings, the supply of water, access to the sea, space for recreation, and as usual, in any discussion of cadet training, quote, to confirm the absence of special temptations in the morality of the neighborhood. <laughs>
Other more mundane factors included the proximity of a large naval port, hard to see how you can hold those two things together, and convenient access by railway. The committee reported in 1877, although again their findings have largely escaped attention. The few interested commentators have concluded that their survey was limited to eight or nine sites along the south coast. But in fact, the original document shows that 28 sites for a naval college at 12 different locations in the UK were examined. Most were easily dismissed, and the first to go were sites at Portsmouth, Devonport, and Milford Haven on the usual grounds of, quote, the proximity of immoral temptations. <laughs> sites at Hailing Island, at Westwood Ho, and Poole were disqualified for lack of suitable bathing or boating facilities. Remarkable when one considers that Poole Harbour is one of the largest in the country. Weymouth, clearly invoking memories of Britannia's unhappy stay at Portland in the early 1860s, was also dismissed. In fact, in the committee's opinion, there were only three realistic locations. Wooten Creek on the Isle of Wight, a stretch of ground at Hamble on the shores of the Solent, and the original choice at Mount Boone in Dartmouth. This slide shows a crowded river dart, possibly at regatta time about 1870. The training ships can be seen way upstream, and the prominent high land to the left of them is Mount Boone. The three sites were then investigated with true Victorian diligence. Royal engineers excavated subsoil, annual rainfall was measured, the death rate, causes of death, and prevalence of disease in the local population were analysed, and the nature of the surrounding countryside examined. The sites on the Solent had much to recommend them, but eventually the committee recommended that the First Lord's original decision, that a new college should be built on the hill above Dartmouth, be implemented. Predictably, there were howls from thwarted constituencies, and in May 1877, the government admitted that no final decision would be taken until the First Lord who was seriously ill, returned to the house. The situation was complicated in July when the owners of the Dartmouth site informed the Admiralty that they didn't want to sell the land, a decision which reignited constituency interest. On the 27th of July, the Chancellor of the Exchequer closed discussion by announcing that the whole matter would be deferred pending the first Lord of the Admiralty's return to health. But alas, two days later, George Ward Hunt died, and with his death, the issue of the Naval College again faded from the headlines. The United Service magazine had predicted that the college project would depend very much on the views of the new First Lord, and it was right. Although the summary prepared for his successor, W.H. Smith, indeed it is he of newspaper kiosk fame, stressed that, quote, the proposed college was a matter that Mr. Ward Hunt took a personal interest in, but no action followed. In fact, there's no further discussion in Admiralty Papers for a number of years. But it's clear that although the plan for shoreside training came to nothing, the matter was seriously considered, and but for the claims of competing constituencies and the need to appoint a committee of arbitration, a naval college may well have been built at Dartmouth as early as 1875. That it was not was undoubtedly due to the demise of George Ward Hunt and the personal preferences of his successor, who could, of course, quote the Rice Committee conclusion that while a new college was desirable, the Britannia remained adequate for cadets' training. If further approval were required for the old training ship, it came in the autumn of 1877 with the arrival on board of Queen Victoria's grandsons, Prince Albert and Prince George. And here they are on the River Dart, Britannia in the background. The figure in the bow is Prince Albert, always known as Eddie, who, as the eldest son of the Prince of Wales, was expected to become king. His academic performance at Dartmouth, however, gave an early indication that he might be, in the modern parlance, a brick short of a load. His subsequent behaviour was also worrying, for it included deliberately setting fire to the palace at Sandringham, and later frequenting gay clubs in the West End, dressed as a woman with the pseudonym Vicky. 
Clearly there were concerns about the stability of the monarchy and the adventures of Eddie make the current tales of Princess Diana seem like something from the Women's Institute. But alas, Eddie died in 1892 and eventually his less colourful brother who had excelled as a cadet in the Britannia came to the throne as King George V. For our purposes, much as I'd like to tell you more about the life of Eddie, royal endorsement for the ship seems to have effectively stopped the ship versus shore debate. But the issue rose again in different form with the appointment of a committee to examine cadet education in March 1885. And their conclusions centred principally on the separation of general education from practical experience. The former, they felt, could be safely entrusted to the British public schools. The latter would be given to the seagoing navy. In the unlikely event that this didn't meet the requirement, the committee suggested that the Admiralty might like to establish its own public school to be called Nelson College. This would be self-supporting and take boys between 10 and 16 who would follow a specialised course in surroundings deliberately set up to resemble those of Eton and Harrow. On submission to the Admiralty Board, however, its findings were rejected, prompting a succession of attacks on the training ship centred on habitability and health. It was clear that despite the intransigence of the Admiralty Board, there were now intractable problems with Britannia and that these would not go away. They arose in part from a wider concern about the suitability of old hulks for training and accommodation. Hulks had been a feature of almost every naval port for much of the century. And in 1890, there were still more than 30 old battleships and frigates serving as receiving vessels, training establishments and barrack accommodation. Some of these were a good deal older than the Britannia. St. Vincent, the boys' training ship at Portsmouth, was a first-rate battleship of 1815, and the three-decker Implacable at Plymouth was even older. While some were still in reasonable condition, the hulks had outstayed their welcome, and a programme for barracks on shore, particularly at Portsmouth and Devonport, was now being discussed. To some extent, Britannia was caught up in this movement, but there were also more specific problems. They arose from an increasing number of cadets, from sporadic outbreaks of bullying, and the supposed effects of onboard life on health and well-being. As late as 1881, there were only 130 cadets on board, but from the mid-1880s, numbers began to rise. From 1891, the number always exceeded 120, and by 1902, the service was accepting more than 200 young officers a year. While numbers always varied, towards the end of the period it was clear that sufficient accommodation could only be provided by reducing the length of the training. And this, incidentally, is Sunday morning service on board in 1896. Clearly, there were limits to the extent that training could be manipulated, and the expansion of the Royal Navy continuing unabated, discussion again turned to the idea of a naval college. This time there was no opposition, partly because of the general trend to move facilities ashore, but more immediately because Britannia had now been struck by a series of epidemics which critics linked to overcrowding and poor habitability. By 1896, the First Lord, George Goshen, determined on a shift to shore training. There was no debate, and a short paragraph in Naval Estimates announced that because of serious defects in the ship, the Admiralty proposed to replace Britannia with a college on the high ground above Dartmouth. Work began on levelling and preparing the steep site, and the search began for an architect. After a deal of bickering, Aston Webb, an eminent and fashionable building designer, was chosen. This slide shows one of his early sketches for the college. As you can see, the sacred parade ground, which everybody at Dartmouth always makes such a fuss about, was never part of the original conception. Indeed, it was not built until 1923 and was always intended to be a rose garden. Separate plans were also drawn up for the hospital, later known as Hawk Block, and so prevalent were the epidemics of the period that this proceeded ahead of the building of the main college. You'll note that the architect's sketch gives the impression that the site is flat, but as anyone who's ever been there, and as this slide from 1908 shows, 
it was anything but. On the 18th of April that year, the Admiralty appointed Higgs and Hill as the builders for a three and a half year project at the cost of £225,000. Webb's design for the Royal Naval College was considerably smaller than the present structure and consisted solely of what is now just the front of the college, the modern A, B and O blocks, the mess, the chapel, the captain's house and the wardroom, very roughly approximating to what you see on this contemporary slide. Naturally enough, for a stone frigate, there was a quarter deck, a poop, a bridge, and a panel dining hall. Now the senior gun room with this extensive gallery, and it gives you something of a feeling, I suppose, of a Tudor mansion. What was absolutely clear from the arrangement of the accommodation and the teaching spaces was that the design was not inspired or driven by any change in educational philosophy or, for that matter, increased intake. Clearly meant for about the same number of cadets, 280 serving in the old ship in 1900, it was a brick-built representation of the status quo. A literal representation, if you like, of a ship ashore. Thus, its internal arrangements reflected, and indeed still do reflect, the four-term organisation evidence in the Britannia. The new buildings had four sets of dormitories, and rec spaces, four long tables in the dining room, and gun rooms with four sets of windows looking out to sea, and so on. Little consideration seems to have been given to the fact that the Royal Navy was in the middle of unparalleled expansion, and therefore might need more officers. For the time being, Webb's structure was a splendid assertion of that massive naval superiority which had given Britain and her empire wealth and security. It was nothing less than the Diamond Jubilee Review of the fleet assembled in stone and brick. By 1902, the college had been under construction for almost two years, but it was still far from finished. Indeed, it would be a further three years before cadets would be admitted. It may have been over a century ago, but this particular defence project was seriously late and well over budget. Training in the ship would continue until the college opened in 1905. But by this time, a new scheme of education was underway. And the original notion that the college would replicate the Britannia regime was completely discarded. On Christmas Day 1902, the Selborne Memorandum was published. A scheme of education named after the First Lord, but in fact, the work of Admiral Sir John Fisher. Now, the details of this scheme lie outside this particular paper, but suffice to say that the amalgamation of engineer and executive training more than doubled the number of entrants every year and produced about a thousand cadets under training at any one time. It thus required not only a complete revision of the plans for Dartmouth, but the building of a second college on the Isle of Wight. Fisher threw all his energy into the establishment of this preparatory school which would take entrance in the first two years of the scheme. The king agreed that Osborne House might be used, although the main portion of it was now a military hospital, and thus the old stables became the nucleus of the new establishment, prompting the jibe that while the new college at Dartmouth looked like a set of stables, the new college at Osborne really was one. And this particular view of the Osborne dormitory seems to confirm this. Additional new buildings were required and work on the foundations began in March 1903 with the first cadet entry arriving that September. Dartmouth admitted its first students two years later, thus having searched for more than 50 years for one naval college within a matter of 18 months, the Royal Navy now had two. What then can we conclude about the 50 years or so that covered the various attempts to establish Dartmouth. Well, I think perhaps to recognise, first place, that such attempts took place. Much as the ship Britannia was venerated, and that its hallmarks, rigorous discipline, austere conditions, concentration on practical and vocational skills, became synonymous with the world's premier navy, there were also other approaches. In other words, there was always an active debate about how young officers should best be trained 
and educated. Time has precluded talking about the contribution of particular reformers, but they included figures such as naval officers James Goodenough, Alfred Ryder, Charles Hope, and later Admiral Sir Herbert Richmond, and civilians such as Joseph Woolley, the Admiralty's first director of education, uh, J.K. Lawton, and later Julian Corbett. They were never a reforming group in the general sense of the word, in the sense that they held a sort of unified vision. But they did try to exercise influence on various inquiring committees and ensured that naval education remained high on the agenda in committee and, for example, at the Royal United Service Institute. The most obvious absentee from the list of those urging educational reform is Sir John Fisher. And, of course, despite the fuss they make of him down at Dartmouth, it's quite clear from my research that he had absolutely nothing to do with the founding of a new college there. When the decision to bring training ashore was taken in 1896, Fisher was still commander-in-chief in the West Indies, and thus some six years away from his post as second sea lord and his sponsorship of the new scheme. It will be equally apparent that not only did Fisher have nothing to do with the new college, but the new college had nothing to do with Fisher's scheme. The one predated the other by more than four years. And Fisher's input, when it finally came, had the effect not of placing young officer education on an even keel, but rather of throwing the original Dartmouth concept into complete turmoil. It's also clear that although the term Dartmouth trained, or a typical Dartmouth product, is now part of a world naval vocabulary, it well might not have been. We may easily have produced a generation of officers from the 1870s onwards, proud to proclaim that they were products of Weymouth, Wootton Creek, or indeed Westwood Ho. Trained at the Royal Naval College Hailing Island, for example, might not have the same social cachet as the alma mater, but doubtless its cadets would have served their country with the pride and dedication synonymous for many years with the words Dartmouth trained. Dr Dickinson was asked six questions. Question 1. Considering the underlying changes in perceptions of this training and education, and the changing needs of the technology associated with a naval officer's work, does this lend weight to the debate about the proximity to other universities and the ideas of synergy? I think if there's a sort of dichotomy in senior naval officers thinking about education and training in the second half of the 19th century, it arises out of a on the one hand, a sort of overwhelming admiration for what British public schools were doing. I mean, in that sort of post-Arnoldian reformed public school structure, the whole advent of the proprietary public schools in the 1860s and 70s, the amount of new money coming from the industrialized middle classes to educate their sons in the manner of the sort of next social level up, which they so admired. I mean, one sees in the literature utter admiration for this system of education to the extent that at one point people are advocating that the whole of the entry into the Navy should simply be recruited from perhaps the most prominent public schools of the country. I mean, six or eight great public schools would be tasked with producing 70 or 80 of, and I think the quote is, the best boys Britain can produce. The problem with it was it ran absolutely smack bang into that other central tenet of naval thinking about youngsters. And that was that they must be entered into the service at the youngest possible point. That you must take people while their minds are malleable and capable of being formed. This sort of Victorian notion that the brain was plastic and that in this formatory period, what you did with people produced a sort of calculable effect, which would, you know, see the child produce the adult. And if you were going to send people to public schools, you couldn't really get them into the Navy until a much later age. And this, in essence, is the sort of debate that goes on. The universities don't enter into it at all. I think my research showed that over the second half of the 19th century, about 200 officers joined the army from Oxford and Cambridge. So there's absolutely no indication that university-level education comes into naval thinking. So, I mean, I think that's the sort of the, the dilemma they face. So most senior officers, you know, if you take the leadership of World War II, you know, A.B. and J. Cunningham, Bert Ramsey, Somerville, Horton, people like this, they all go to preparatory school 
usually a preparatory school with a strong naval slant, and then they come into the service age 13 into the training ship, effectively in some senses bypassing what one might call real education altogether. Question two, was there any influence that you identified, particularly in the last 20 years of the 19th century, with the parallel development with the engineering branch, Marlborough, Portsmouth, and the establishment of the Royal Naval College at Keele? And are there any influences there regarding officer entry to the army? Also, did the Admiralty take any notice of the parallel developments for the army with the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich and Sandhurst? To take the second part of your question first, there is almost no point of contact between the army and the navy in terms of devising educational regimes, looking at what each other did, learning from each other, these sorts of things. I mean, the the two institutions are almost entirely separate. Indeed, I mean, if you look at something like Gwyn Harris Jenkins' study of the British Army in the 19th century, turn to the index and I think you'll see the entry for Royal Navy. I mean, there are about two entries in the whole of the book, and it's, it's about that thick. No, very little contrast and comparison. If you're looking for comparisons, then the comparisons tend to be not between the Navy and the Army, but between the Royal Navy and other navies. What are the Americans doing? What are the Russians doing? What are the French doing? Now, this is quite pronounced. Indeed, it almost predates the more popularly recognized period of Anglo-German, Anglo-Japanese naval rivalry in the later parts of the century. People in the 1870s are looking at Annapolis. They are looking at the academy at St. Petersburg and usually concluding, actually, these guys do things better than we do. The problem, of course, is that when you go to the American or the Russian or the Japanese or the French literature, the same observations are being made, only the other way around. You know, it's it, this, the other man's grass is always greener. As far as engineers are concerned, I mean, you use the word parallel. I mean, what you have from about 1870 until 1902 is two parallel systems, where the Marlborough is, in effect, the Britannia, and where the Royal Naval College Keam eventually parallels BRNC. I mean, it's Fisher's 1902 plan to amalgamate the two branches, the executive and the engineer, to be trained together, which looks like the radical move that will fundamentally change the character of the British officer corps. And, of course, in 1899, the Americans had done it. They had completely dispensed with the term engineer and executive, and they have produced officers of the line, which, of course, they have until this day. More work needs to be done on this in the British case But it seems clear that it's really social prejudice that eventually ends the British experiment. It only lasts until 1925, and then the branches go their separate ways again. But that's really volume two of my work, which I'm still hacking away at. Question three. Education and training can be considered as two separate things. When Dartmouth was planned, was that more about education than training? And therefore, was there the ability to enter the Navy without going to Dartmouth and just go into training? I think the, the terms education and training for the period up to 1902, as used in that time, are generally interchangeable. Nobody really seeks to make a distinction between the two words. Largely, I think, because you're dealing with very young people. What is quite clear is that the sort of education, if we can call it that, is essentially vocational in character. Everything about it is orientated towards the task that people will have to do at the end of it. So, for instance, right up to the end of the Britannia, and possibly, I mean, I'm not there in my work yet, in the early years of the college, it was forbidden for cadets to read novels, full stop. I mean, if you were caught with a novel, then it was a disciplinary offence. And the punishment records of the Britannia, which are still in the Naval College in the archive, will show you uh, entries like court reading a novel. I mean, I hope you're seeing historical continuities here. Right? Uh, I mean, after whistling immediately after divine service, and one I particularly like for 12 and 13 year olds, childish behavior. <laughs> I mean, the notion that childish behavior is a disciplinary offense for a 12-year-old 
naval cadet, I think. So, in a sense, that sort of education, if you can call it that, which was strongly mathematical, the Britannia syllabus, although it does go through various iterations, for almost the whole period in the ship, 90% of it deals with subjects roughly under the heading of mathematics, navigation, algebra, geometry, this sort of thing, with a little French, a little bit of English, and not much else really. So it's defined in quite careful terms. The danger, I think, as a commentator, and this is where I've sought in my work to try to place what was going on in the Navy in context, is it has to be remembered what the general education of similar institutions was at that time. Now, most people going to Winchester or Eton or Harrow or Rugby in the 1880s and 1890s are swallowing pretty much an undigested diet of Latin and Greek. It's no broader, really, than what's going on here. Question four. Was public interest in the education of naval officers solely a late 19th century phenomenon? I think there are periods, as you would expect, I mean, if we take the educational process in the service, if we take a datum point, let's say, as, as 1702, with the introduction of the first naval schoolmasters serving at, at sea, and a naval academy from 1733 onwards, over that period, it has certain sorts of peaks and, and troughs. It's not surprisingly, for instance, the introduction of new technology usually goes along with an interest in the sort of education and training that's taking place. So one sees a flurry, for example, around 1860 and the introduction of the ironclad battleship. One sees it again in the 1890s, as I alluded to before, as they start to look at other navies and see them as competitors and try to decide whether the other guys are doing things properly. As a general conclusion, I think, one has to say, if we take the same methodological approach as our predecessors and compare ourselves principally with what other navies are doing, I think the differences are now quite pronounced. You know, in the U.S. Navy, I think by 1922, they were insisting that commanders or officers of commander rank and above should have a master's degree. From the start of the 20th century, Annapolis is teaching a, a degree course. The French take it very seriously. I mean, right from the, the earliest times, the earliest naval training schools in Rochefort and Brest devote extended periods to shoreside educational training. For the British, the tradition is much more that one learns one's job at the shoulder of the next most senior guy, that the cockpit is really the classroom. That's where you learn things. And, of course, for years, naval historians have attributed superior standards in seamanship and the general application of violence at sea to this sort of apprenticeship type system. The problem was, as I show in my book, by the 1850s, it just isn't producing the results. I mean, the Crimean War shows that young officer performance <coughs> is simply not up to, to desired standards. And by the 1860s, people are starting to, to flow out of the service. The signing on as midshipmen a bit like sort of second lieutenants in the household cavalry, and just doing a few years, enjoying whatever social dimensions there were to the job, and then moving on. And the foundation of the Britannia is really in response to, I mean, it's a hard-headed, we've got to do something about retention-type move. And investing in education and training was seen to have long-term results, measurable output in terms of, people staying in the service and of course crucially showing the ability to pass the exam for lieutenant and move on into the train onto the train strength question five you described how the student numbers stayed relatively constant did the staff numbers and composition also remain constant the staff in the training ship was almost equally divided between civilian academic staff and staff officers just as any of you in naval uniform will recognize from Dartmouth in your own time. I mean, right from 1857, there were civilian instructors on board to teach the, the academic portion of, of the syllabus. Tutor sets exist right from the start. From 1857, Monday night, is tutor sets. Appalling thought. Um, <laughs> uh, most of my reading of the later stuff suggests that 
most staff officers had relatively little to do, that academic training was self-evidently for the academics. Seamanship and basic boat work and rigging and that sort of thing was handled by petty officers. And for the staff officers, it was generally considered a sort of stasis, really, in between more demanding work at sea. And so, yes, things do stay reasonably static. With the appointment of a chief instructor in the 1860s, a guy called Aldous, who comes from Clifton College and remains for the next 30 years, there was an attempt to populate the academic staff with public school master type people. And when I say type people, I suppose I mean ordained clergymen, really. But no, I mean, the continuity is the, the general name of the game in that regard. Question six. Did the staff at Dartmouth consider it to be a good appointment? Well, actually, I mean, you, you've posed that as a, as a simple question, but it, in fact, it's actually quite a complex one. Because in a sense, what you're asking is, is an appointment to Dartmouth a key appointment on a route to success? And identification of routes to success is, I would suggest, almost a full-time sub-dimension of British naval history. (laughs) I mean, it seems to me that the principal route to success depends not so much on individual appointments to ships, but on a good deal of patronage. So the best correlation you can find between an admiral of the fleet and anything else is service as a flag captain. So if you've served as flag captain to a previous commander-in-chief, then your chances of moving up to the highest position are thus enhanced. Flag lieutenant will, of course, produce slightly longer odds, but they're pretty good compared to most people. And, of course, you can't deny the simple business of the ability of senior officers to select the people that they wanted, and indeed of well-connected officers exercising the right to turn down appointments. People like Bert Ramsey or David Beatty, both of whom marry exceptionally wealthy women, go along to see the appointer, and he says, well, Bert, I'm thinking of of sending you to HMS Indescribable. And Bert says, well, I don't know, I think I'll... um, I think I'll pass on that one, nip off onto half pay for six months and come back and see, you know, what's in the pot. So, I mean, I think one can't apply too many of sort of contemporary career progression to what happened in those days. Professor Dickinson can be contacted by email at hdickinson.jscsc at defenceacademy.mod.uk. Please note that the views expressed in this presentation are entirely and solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect official thinking and policy of either Her Majesty's Government or the Ministry of Defence.